back to another week of club. I hope you guys are doing great on your midterms and lab practical so far, and they've all been going smooth um, through your Zooms or however Blackboard, I guess. This week, we're going to be covering cranial nerves, so we're going to be diving a little bit more into the brainstem. Last week, Rope covered um, pretty in depth our midbrain, which is the upper part of our brainstem, and now we're going to be talking a little bit more about the cranial nerves that live inside of our brainstem. So tonight we're just going to review the loop and keep building on that because if really at the end of this quarter you guys get nothing else, we really want you to be able to understand that loop that we've been teaching you so that you can think through the nervous system and really assess where um, in that seven levels of a lesion something in that system might be going on. And then we're going to go over just basic cranial nerve anatomy and then go through testing each of them with breakouts at the end. So here's our lovely loop that we've been going over. So we started with our cortex and cerebellum. So we know that our right body goes to our right cortex, ipsilateral, or our right cerebellum, sorry, our ipsilateral cerebellum, and then to our contralateral cortex. And we went over last week about how our cortex communicates back and forth with our mesencephalon. And our, so we added to the pathway our body, so our right body goes to our ipsilateral cerebellum, crosses over to the contralateral mesencephalon, which then communicates back and forth with the cortex. So last week, or this week, we're going to be adding in this component, the PMRF which stands for pontomedullary reticular formation. And so when we're talking about the brainstem, we classically think of three different parts, the midbrain or mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. The PMRF is focusing on the pons and the medulla, and together that reticular formation, which is that network of all of the cranial nerves and nuclei that live in that region, are extremely important for our autonomic uh, nervous system and a lot of our vital functions. So we're going to cover a whole week on autonomics next week and go a lot more in depth um, into that. But this week we're going to be adding this part into our loop. So we're going to be going cortex down to our ipsilateral pontomedullary reticular formation and also thinking about our mesencephalon as well and combining these two to talk about our brainstem. And so I want you guys to pay attention to all of the things that connect in to our PMRF. So we already talked about our cerebellum and how our cerebellum is going to go to the contralateral cortex down to the, to the ipsilateral PMRF and then that PMRF is communicating with the ipsilateral vestibular system and the ipsilateral cortex. So my right cerebellum is communicating with my right PMRF, my right vestibular system is communicating with my right PMRF, my right cortex is communicating with my right PMRF, and, um, and we just want to think about that as we're going through that loop. Okay. okay, so now that we've gone over all of these functional connections, I want to um, give you guys this simple concept that is actually, I think, going to help you guys apply what we're doing and give you importance to it. So the reason this loop becomes so important is because when you're doing a stimulus such as, um, let's say we're going to use cranial nerve example. When you're stimulating the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, we know that in the same region we have cranial nerve 6, abducens, as well as cranial nerve 7. And so one thing that I want you guys to understand is when we're talking about this pathway and stimulating things along the pathway, or when we're talking about within that pathway, within our PMRF, within our pons, so more specifically, when we're stimulating one area, so our trigeminal nerve, we're also stimulating the areas around it. It's really hard to be that specific. We can be as, we can be as specific as possible, but it's, um, I don't want you guys to think that when we are um, exciting cranial nerve five, we are stimulating that area probably the most highly, but we are also stim we are causing stimulation to the whole area. So that's why when we're looking at our cranial nerve exam and we really want to analyze the brainstem because of how important it is, we really want to look at the fact that 
when we're assessing the region, if we see an area of dysfunction, it's really important to assess the areas around it. So when we are assessing that pontine area, we want to assess not only the cranial nerves um, around the other nuclei in the pontine, as well as maybe we want to look at the medulla or the midbrain, which are right above and below it as well as, and we learned in those um, in the pathway before, that our vestibular system, so our ipsilateral vestibular system has high input into our PMRF. Our cortex, our ipsilateral cortex has extremely high input into our PMRF. Our cerebellum has high input into our PMRF. And so not only when we're looking within the brainstem, if we want to um, assess the different areas of the brainstem and understand how each area is, is functioning, we want to then look further out and say, okay, is the root cause of dysfunction coming from this area within the brainstem, or is it actually coming from the vestibular system, which a dysfunctioning vestibular system then causes transneurodegeneration, so lack of stimuli, to our PMRF and is starting to cause dysfunction in this pontine region or our medullary region? Or is a, is a lesion in our cortex starting to cause a area of dysfunction in our brainstem? Or is it our cerebellum that's causing um, an area? If our cerebellum is overfiring, is it starting to cause too much stimulation to our vagus nerve and causing dysfunction within our PMRF? So we want to be thinking about these different loops and how all of them are connected functionally. And so the way that Michael McAuliffe gave a visual to this, um, I think was really helpful is to use this apartment style complex um, visual. So imagine you're living in an apartment complex and you have your neighbors uh, upstairs and you have your neighbors to either side of you and below you. So you're surrounded by other stimuli. And so the idea is if you do an eye movement to, um, to stimulate the, let's say we're doing lateral eye movement. So we're stimulating cranial nerve six and then you also um, want to stimulate that pontine area, you can use sound. And so if someone is having trouble doing their eye movements back and forth, we can then also, if using eye movements to rehab that area of the brain isn't working well, we can also use something else in that region, such as the vestibular cochlear nerve, using our cochlear part of that to use sound or our temporal lobe coming down into the PMRF to stimulate sound to excite that region to get that um, cranial nerve six to fire better um, and or just to increase its um, central integrated state and help it to have better function. So the idea is that if your neighbor is having a party, they're blasting music, that sound is coming through your walls. It's not as loud, but it's still sound and stimulus. And so you are, you are also having a party. And then the same thing, if your neighbor upstairs is stomping down on you, you're going to hear that. And then maybe you start banging something back. So it's a constant back and forth in this connection that we have within our brain and brainstem, all of these connections that we have. Um, and also the same way goes if you have um, your neighbor, you can make it like the pathway. So if your neighbor is the cerebellum and then your upstairs neighbor is the cortex and you're going through your apartment is the mesencephalon. When one neighbor is uh, having a party and then that message goes to you, you start to have a party and then your music starts to go to your upstairs neighbor. So you can think of it as functional connections as well as how other therapies can stimulate different areas of the brain so that you can overlap things. And um, so that way, sometimes you don't have to go directly to the area of lesion. You can go around it to help um, activate the area that you want if, um, if the patient can't handle it, a direct stimulation. So that was long-winded, but I hope it helped you guys to understand really the importance of what we're looking at with these cranial nerves. Because the point of the exam isn't to teach you guys the cranial nerves, I think you guys have seen them before in school, but it's really to get this concept of how we can look at the different regions of the brainstem and assess their function, and then look further out to the connections that are um, connections within the brain and our nervous system that, um, that go with that area that we want to assess and see where the lesion lies, if it is truly in our brainstem 
or if it's really coming from another part of that connection functional loop. So this is just a picture of our brain. It's um, a underside view. And so we're seeing our olfactory nerve at the top in our optic nerve. And then we go down into the 12. And they're pretty much laid out from 1 to 12 at the bottom, except you'll see that we have, so 1 and 2 are technically kind of outside. They're a little bit outside. Of, they're not in the brain stem. And I'll show you where they are, the names of them, um, on the next slide. But then our ocular motor and our trochlear nerve, three and four, are lie in our midbrain. We talked a lot about those last week. And then as soon as we get into cranial nerve five, we're in the pons. And so our cranial nerve five lies on the lateral aspects of the, um, of the pons. And then six, seven, and eight all lie in that pontomedullary junction. So they're very close in between them. And it starts, cranial nerve six is the most medial, and then it goes six, seven, and eight going lateral on either side. So six, seven, eight. And then we have nine, 10, and 11. And then on the lateral aspects of the mula and the um, cranial nerve 12 is a little bit more medial. And so this is just our anatomy that we see in, in school. But something that I want you guys to draw to help you guys follow along as we're talking about the different cranial nerves, just to have an easy picture understanding for yourselves if you're taking notes at all. Um, you can draw our basic brain stem that we taught you guys from VOR. So this is our midbrain, our pons, and our medulla. And then our cranial nerves are bilateral, but I just drew them on one side to make it the picture hopefully a little bit more clear for you guys. So we have cranial nerve one and two, which cranial nerve one lies in what we say is our telencephalon or a more cortical area. We have cranial nerve two, which is in more of our diencephalon, which we think of as our thalamic area. We have cranial nerves three and four, which lie in the mesencephalon. We have five, six, seven, and eight, like I was just telling you guys, and then nine, 10, 11, and 12 in our medulla. So the groupings as it goes is two, two, four, four. So if that helps you, you don't have to remember where the cutoffs are, or which ones where, just two, two, four, four and it'll help you guys. So just draw this down if it helps. And um, another reason it might be helpful to write it down is when you're going through these, this cranial nerve exam with us and you're um, assessing your partners, if you start to notice um, that maybe they have an area of dysfunction or a difference between the left and right side, you can mark it down on your drawing so you can remember. And then, then at the end, look and see if they have um, more findings in a particular area of the brainstem or on a particular side of the brainstem. And then you can use the pieces of the vestibular system, the cerebellum, and the cortical test that we've already taught you guys and see if you can find a pattern for them or a pathway or just um, something that you think would be helpful. And then test, retest. That's how we do it. Oops. OK. So, like I was just saying, our cranial nerve one and two lie outside the brainstem in the telencephalon and diencephalon, cranial nerves threes and four, and our mesencephalon, and then we have pons and medulla. These are the names in case you guys forgot them, but hopefully you have this down by now. So I'm just gonna go through each cranial nerve individually, and then we're gonna break it up into, um, we're gonna do little breakouts after each kind of section of the brainstem to go through the exam with you, and hopefully you guys can have a partner to go through it with you. But we're just going to go over them first. So our olfactory nerve is, has, um, is a sensory component, so it's our sense of smell. You want to also inspect in the nostril to see if they have any, um, any blockages that you can see visually. Um, you want to ask if they've noticed any changes in their smell, as well as um, you want to test with both a mild and a strong scent. So you want to see if they can recognize a smell. So you want to see the distance it takes them to recognize a smell, as well as if they can recognize it as a particular smell, not just know that they're smelling something. You want to see further if they can differentiate the smell of an orange or a lemon or lavender or coffee or whatever you're using um, for your olfactory test. Cranial nerve two, we went over um, 
some of the ways you can test it actually in our lobes of the brain week when we were talking about the um, occipital lobe, but it's also sensory. Its main function is visual acuity and color perception. So when you go and visit your um, optometrist and you go for your daily or your yearly eye exams and they have you look at the Snelling's eye chart and they have the big E on top and see how far down you can read. That is um, testing your visual acuity as well as color perception. Um, if you've ever had a colorblind test, those um, or just being able to recognize the difference between red, blue, green, or a shape or something like that um, can test this. And so then our reflexes, so we have three reflexes, direct light, indirect light, and accommodation, which are also combined with our cranial nerve three function. So our cranial nerve two gives us the sensory component of these reflexes. It helps us to um, know whether we're focusing, to focus on an object, and then also to detect if we have a light stimulus um, or anything coming in. So let's move on to the next one. So our ocular motor. This one we've talked a lot about in the past couple of weeks, especially last week with our pupillary light reflex with our highlight on the midbrain. And so we know due to our rule SO4, LR6, all over three, that all of our eye muscles except superior oblique and lateral rectus, that they're all innervated by cranial nerve three. So when we do that um, cardinal fields of gaze, that is very strongly looking at our cranial nerve three, um, as well as our other eye muscles four and six. But um, we know our eye muscles are important with cranial nerve six. Another thing that we um, talked about is ptosis. And so our cranial nerve three is also responsible for activating our levator palpebrae superioris, which is the muscle that elevates our eyelid. And so if you've ever seen someone with kind of like a droopy eyelid or one just kind of sags a little bit more, we call that ptosis. And so you can see them sometimes very seriously if a person has a lazy eye or an eye that doesn't have as um, strong a vision, sometimes they're combined, sometimes they're not. But, um, but if you do see this, sometimes you can notice it more functionally. And so that's something that I challenge you guys to do. As soon as you start looking for it in people, you're going to see it every time. So when you're scrolling on Instagram this next week, start to just look at your friends' faces and notice if you can see a difference in their facial symmetry, especially looking at their eyelids to see if you can see um, a ptosis on them. And then ciliary muscles, we covered these a lot last week with our pupillary light response. And we're gonna talk about it a lot more because of its important parasympathetic function that our Edinger-Westfall nucleus has when we talk about autonomics next week um, in the role that it has in dilating our, or in constricting our pupils, sorry. Um, and then we have our reflexes that I was just mentioning in cranial nerve two. So the motor component of these. So when we're doing the direct light reflex, we want to have the patient look straight forward and we want to shine a light into their eye from lateral to medial, but not crossing to the opposite side visual field. And so when you shine a light into your patient's eye, you want to take note of things. So before you even shine the light into their eye, you want to just notice and observe the size of, their pa of the patient's pupils on both sides, if they, what size they are, how big they are, if they're already pretty constricted, um, taking account the lighting in the room, but um, take note if they're really constricted, if they're um, pretty dilated, or if they're already moving, if they have a hippus. And then I want you guys to, when you shine the light in, you want to take note, okay, so if we know that they already had a pretty strong dilation, we want to see how much and compare, like relatively, how much did it constrict? Or if their eye was already pretty constricted, how much relatively did it constrict further? Or if it was normal, just how, how much and how quickly did it constrict? And so then when you're noticing those two, how quickly and how much did they constrict, you then also want to pay attention to how long does that constriction hold? Or does it come in and then just bounce back? Or does it come in slowly and then hippus? Does it bounce back slowly? Or you want to be paying attention to all of these different things because um, they will be important in helping you to determine what exactly um, going on with that patient. 
And then indirect light reflex, very similar to direct. You're looking for the same things, but this time when you're shining the light in the right eye, you're just going to be looking at the patient's left eye um, where there's no light stimulus and seeing if they have um, a equal response to the left eye. And then accommodation. So that is when it's going to help us converge or diverge when we are looking at objects um, up close or far in the distance. And so when we're looking at a, an object up close to focus on it and, um, and focus and be able to read up close or see an object up close, our eyes will slightly converge. And when we converge, our eyes will, um, will constrict a little bit. And so that change in the shape of our lens as well as the constriction or dilation of our pupil respective to the eye movements and um, the vision that we're trying to achieve is our accommodation reflex. And so you want to pay attention to the ability um, of the accommodation. When they're converging, do both eyes come in equally or does one stay in? Does one come in and bounce out? Um, do their pupils constrict bilaterally? And you just want to be paying attention. Really the key of this exam and um, with all of these different all of these different cranial nerves is really to be collecting pieces of information and pieces of the puzzle that you can tie to other findings that you have in your cranial nerve exam or in your just in your whole neurological exam as well to be able to paint the picture of what's going on in that patient's nervous system. The point isn't just to say how is their ocular motor um, nerve looking, then you want to take it further. Okay, how is their midbrain working? How is their autonomic function working? And you want to keep going out until you can get an entire picture of that person's nervous system to find out what is the most important thing going on for them and how can you help them most effectively. So we already talked a lot about our trochlear nerve and our um, abducens when we talked about our eye movement. So cranial nerve six, yes, I know I'm putting it in the midbrain section. It's technically in the pond, but it goes with eye movement, so I added them together. We have our rule, SO4, LR6, all over three. Remember these lovely pictures that we talked about. Hopefully you guys can still remember all of your eye movements. Um, but this, these are motor nerves, and the way we test them along with our cranial nerve three is by just doing our simple H or um, having the patient look in different directions to test their eye movements. All right, so let's go to our first breakout and hopefully grab a partner, grab your doctor's bag, and we're just gonna do our cortical pontine or cortical mesencephalic breakout. Okay, welcome to our first breakout. I hope you guys have gotten your doctor's bag. You need a pen light and your smells to test um, olfactory and just your finger for our um, eye muscles. So thank you Rope, for being my patient. We're going to start with our olfactory nerve. So can, you have, can I have you close your eyes and um, close one of your nostrils for me? And then I'm going to open it. I'm gonna bring a scent closer to your nose. Tell me when you smell it. Orange. All right, orange. Uh, good job. So he was able to smell the scent as well as identify it. So both components are important. So can I have you keep your eyes closed and close the other nostril? So now for this one, I'm going to bring another scent. Tell me what it is and when you smell it. Coffee. Okay, so coffee. So it was good to note that he um, was able to smell both and identify both and it makes sense that he was able to smell the coffee, which is a much stronger scent, a little bit sooner than maybe um, a delicate orange smell. And so it is important to test the contrast of smells to um, see if they can identify both, as well as to test the more delicate smell or lighter smell first, so that a more pungent smell like coffee, a very strong smell, doesn't overpower their ability to smell a lighter scent. Um, so test the lighter scent first. And then something that's just kind of fun um, for you guys to know if you want to test it, there's research that has shown that one of the earliest um, tests for Alzheimer's can be to your ability to smell peanut butter. So um, go look up the research article, it's pretty funny, but, um, but if you want to go and see early, early detection of possible Alzheimer's, I'm not saying that is definitive, but um, it is just something good to check once in a while, is check and see if you can smell a 
jar of peanut butter, and you'll also be testing your olfactory nerve. So optic nerve, I don't have a Snelling's chart or a note card or anything, but we're going to use Oscar's first book of manners <laughs> to test Rofe's um, optic nerve. So can I have you please read this sentence for me? You're welcome, and here's some sugar. Very good, Oscar. Thanks. Now scram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now can I have you tell me what color this character is? Green. And then what color is this building? Red. Good job. So Oscar is green and the building was a brick red building. And he did great on both. So I think his optic nerve is working. So now we are going to do um, just the optic or the cardinal fields of gaze using our H. So just follow my thumb. So I like to do it twice. You can do different speeds, um, but you want to be looking for that smoothness of motion, no psychotic intrusions, um, noting any difference between the vertical movements or the horizontal movements, or um, if there is any change in the pupil size, dilation, things like that while he was doing that. All right, so now we're going to perform our direct and indirect light reflex, which is using cranial nerve two and three. So we'll start with the direct. So just look straight ahead at me. So I'm shining the light in his left eye, and I'm looking at his left eye to check for constriction of that pupil. Now I'm going to test his right eye. And remember, you're looking for hippus, how long it stays there, if it bounces right back, or if it stays constricted for a long time, and noting where it was to begin with. So now we're going to do the indirect light reflex. So remember with this one, it's important not to cross his nose and you're going to be looking at the opposite eye that you're shining the light in. And his look pretty good. So now we're going to do accommodation. I'm just going to do um, convergence with him and see how it looks. Looking for both eyes to move in together and for his pupils to constrict slightly. So, and they did that. Good job. Cool. Alrighty, now we're going to keep going with our cranial nerves. Alrighty, hopefully you guys found some findings, or actually hopefully not. Hopefully you have a healthy patient um, for your first breakout of your cranial nerves. We're going to keep going. Now we're in the pons. We're in our trigeminal nerve. And so our trigeminal nerve kind of looks like V's on the lateral side of the pons. And if it helps you, it looks like a V. It's cranial nerve 5, which the Roman numeral is a V. And then it also... So when we say um, the three branches of the, of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, they are also known as V1, V2, and V3. So if you see over here, those are the different divisions. So ophthalmic, you can imagine, is over the region of the eyes. It gives you a clue. The maxillary is a region over your maxilla, maxilla, maxillary bone. And then your mandibular branch, they're named very nicely um, and anatomically. So I love when that happens. So trigeminal, we have motor and sensory, um, sensory functions. Our um, sensory functions, it helps us to detect both sharp and light touch using our spinothalamic and our dorsal column tracts. But um, you, when you're testing sharp and light touch for the trigeminal nerve, it is important not only to test the three different regions to make sure they can um, sense the difference between sharp, um, sharp and light touch within the uh, um, ophthalmic, the maxillary, and mandibular, but it's important to test within the region. So within the region on one side, if they have any differences, so, with, so you want to test in each area, in each of the three areas, probably about at least three different times. And then with also, you want to compare bilaterally. So is there a change in one side of maxillary to the other side um, when you're doing sensation? And then um, our motor is our muscles of mastication. So you want to palpate. If you're in a state as a doctor that um, legally allows you to enter orifices, I know Georgia is not one of them, but if you are in a state, you will be able to palpate inside of the mouth and palpate the um, 
muscles and mastication, you're just looking for tone and symmetry um, on either side. And then that would be our motor component as well as our oculocardiac reflex. And so this is sensory comes from our cranial nerve five and then the, eff the efferent um, or output is our cranial nerve 10, our vagus nerve, which we haven't gotten to yet, but it's an important one, so we'll definitely be talking about it later. But our oculocardiac reflex is one where you would be taking the patient's pulse, and you're gonna have them close their eyes, and you're just gonna lightly press on the patient's eyelid. And so if you do this, you can see that um, the patient's, what should happen at least, when you gently press on the patient's eye is that the pressure will cause a reaction to activate the vagus nerve to, um, to lower the, um, the heart rate. And so you'll see more a slow in the heart rate and activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you're ever super uh, stressed or you just feel your heart pounding, before a test, you have anxiety, anything like that, and you really need to calm down and meditate, one, breathe, it's really helpful, but also, you could use this as kind of like a little hack. I wouldn't hold it for too long, especially if you have children and you want, or you're practicing these exams on them, be careful because the response tends to be stronger in children than in adults, so be really careful because it is a real response and it will lower their heart rate and you just don't want it to go too low. So you can always, as you're doing some deep breaths, just press on your eyes, just gently. It takes no more than like, like you're just touching, I don't even know, like a cloud, like just very softly. And press and breathe and you will start to feel you uh, yourself automatically relax and your heart rate go down. Alrighty, so our facial nerve is um, a fun nerve. It's our kind of emoji nerve is the way we think about it. It's, it deals a lot with um, facial tone and facial expression, so our facial muscles. Um, it's both motory and motor and sensory. So the motor aspect is gonna be our ranges of emotion, so like I was just talking about, um, making facial expressions. And then we have taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue as our sensory component. Um, so our sensory component for the facial nerve, we wanna ask if they've had any changes in taste, if foods taste more bland, if they've noticed any changes in salty, sour, or sweet foods, um, and their ability to, to taste them. And then um, as well as our facial nerve is going to innervate our salivary glands, lacrimal glands, and our um, some of our mucosal glands. And so one way that, I, um, that you can assess these without particularly being like, I'm going to assess the salivary um, glands, because that would be pretty hard, I think. Um, as well as with some of these more minute functions, it's better to tell the patient not that, or tell, not tell the patient that you're going to be watching them because they'll change the way they act. It's not their normal function. So just as when we're um, looking for the patient's normal respiratory rate, we don't tell them that we're assessing their breathing. Um, the same way, with the salivary glands or maybe lacrimal glands, you just wanna look at how the patient is and just observe the information and take it in as pieces of the puzzle. It's not the end all be all, but, um, but it is important to just have notes. So all of these observations and all of these pieces um, that we're learning in the cranial nerves are really to give us that greater understanding of the patient's presentation. So one way that you can sneak this in is um, when you're doing a cranial nerve exam in real practice, the difference between practice and school is in school we're gonna chunk it into very specific one by one things and you go in that order. But when you're doing an exam um, on a patient in your own practice, you're gonna be able to have a little bit more flexibility. So when you have the patient's mouth open to test their um, palate, to look at vagal function as well as glossopharyngeal and um, things like that, so you already have their mouth open. When you're taking that peek inside, just take note of um, how moist their mouth is, the if, how much um, saliva they have, as well as just when they're sitting there, you can kind of note how often they're swallowing. And those little context clues can give you ideas into um, the function of this area as well. So when you're looking at facial tone and facial symmetry, one thing that you can note, it's um, a little bit easier sometimes on our elderly because of their natural wrinkles to notice if there's one side with more wrinkles or the other. 
but all of this all of us have natural facial tone so we're able to see it so you want to look at one of the easiest ways is looking at the labial um, the labial fold right here and so or those smile lines or whatever you want to call them as well as our um, crow's feet up here so you just want to be taking note of the different creases on the patient's face if they're bilateral symmetrical or if one side is kind of droopy and remember we talked about ptosis was more cranial nerve three this is looking at facial overall facial tone and symmetry and so one thing that i think is really important with cranial nerve seven is being able to differentiate between a bell's palsy um, which is that ipsilateral or hemiparalysis paralysis of the facial nerve which causes just um, ipsilateral complete facial loss of tone hypotonia um, versus a stroke which we also know has the clinical presentation of that drooping face is what we um, are known to look for and it's really important to be able to detect both of these and know the difference because they can be serious conditions and so when we're talking about the anatomy of the facial nerve within the brainstem we have a superior and an inferior facial nucleus the superior facial nucleus innervates this upper portion of our face. So think of our surprise um, forehead crinkle lines, being able to lift our eyebrows. And um, basically, if you want to draw the line at your temporal bone, you can think of it as this is the superior portion. And then our inferior portion is our lower face. So our inferior nucleus innervates our lower face. So when we're, um, when we're looking at the superior nerve, it is innervated bilaterally. So from both cortexes, you get innervation into this superior nucleus of the facial nerve. Versus our inferior nucleus will only get ips, uh, will only get innervation from the contralateral cortex. So if I have, um, so this is how you can really tell the difference between a Bell's palsy and a stroke. So when you see um, a Bell's palsy, you know from top to bottom, they have a paralysis in their facial nerve, they have no tone. And so usually this is a lower motor neuron lesion, so a lesion of the actual nu facial nucleus within the brainstem. And this lower, neuron lesion, this lower motor neuron lesion causes the entirety um, of, the f of the half of the face to be paralyzed. Versus in a stroke, often you might see at the beginning um, a little bit of a loss of tone on the forehead but mainly you're, what you're gonna see is that lower half that is innervated by that inferior nucleus is going to have a loss of tone. Because if I had a stroke on my, um, on my left side and I start to see drooping on my right side of my face, my right cortex is still going to be innervating. The, even though I've lost the innervation of my um, of or half the innervation to my superior facial nucleus i still have half of the innervation so i can still have the ability to get tone into the superior portion of my face and so um hopefully that'll help you guys to have a better understanding into the difference between what a bell's palsy presentation might look like and a stroke presentation all right so our vestibular cochlear nerve so we talked a lot about this nerve when we did our vestibular system and we talked a lot about um, these tests so hopefully you guys are familiar with them and we don't have to go over them as in depth but the half of our vestibular uh, cochlear nerve is our cochlear part which we think of as our hearing part and so for that we're going to use our finger rub test which we went over week two when we did lobes of the brain and we were talking about our temporal lobe we have our Weber test and our Rhine test which are using our tuning forks to differentiate um, different lesions within the ear and um, hearing. And this nerve, as you can imagine, is sensory. And then for our vestibular portion, we're gonna look for nystag nystagmus um, when we're doing our different tests. So we did a dix halp hike, as well as we showed you an Epley's maneuver when we were talking about BPPV, as well as you can do a spinning chair test, or um, you can do the CUDA step test we already talked about, or do that, um, you can do the, um, a VOR where you're moving their head back and forth, slowly looking for that equal and opposite eye movement. Um, or you can do a Halmagis where you're doing it quicker to see if um, the quickness 
brings out any sort of dysfunction. Maybe some of you guys have already done a spinning chair toss while you're bored at home in your office chair. It's fun. All right, so now let's go into our pontine breakout. Okay, so we're back for our pontine breakout. Grab your pinwheel and a cotton swab. And if you have something dull um, or just if you want to use your pinwheel, you can do that as well. Um, and we're going to start by testing the trigeminal nerve. So can I have you close your eyes? And I'm going to be touching you with this mm -hmm. pinwheel. Be careful when you're touching people's faces with pinwheels. You don't want to draw blood, and they're very sharp, so please press lightly. So can you feel this? Yes. Was it sharp or dull? Sharp. All right. And then can you feel this? Yes. And can you feel this? Mm-hmm. And does it feel like this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. And does it feel like this? Yes. And then if you want, you can go within. Can you feel that? Mm -hmm. Does it feel like that? Yes. And go within the region to save some time. I'm not going to go through all of that, but you can go through it in each region and then close your eyes again. And can you feel this? Yes. And does it feel like this? Yes. And can you feel this? Yes. And does it feel like this? Yes. So it's important to compare bilaterally within each region as well as comparing each of the regions to each other on one side. Pretty. Close your eyes. Now I'm going to be doing my Q-tip. So can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Does it feel like this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. Okay. Can you feel this? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. This? Yes. Does it feel like this? Yes. Alrighty. So his trigeminal work nerve seems to be working pretty well. We already tested abducens when we did our cardinal fields of gaze, so we're not going to go over that again. Now we're going to test our facial nerve. So can I have you smile real big at me and then frown? <laughs> and can you raise your eyebrows and then look angry, puff out your cheeks, and good job. So his facial nerve is working pretty well, and so can I have you just look straight forward at me? And looking at facial symmetry on him, pretty good. I don't see anything too off, but if you really want to test, there's that TikTok challenge to <laughs> use the mirror thing to see the, un um, the dissymmetry between your two sides of your faces. So maybe that's the real test. Okay, so now we're going to do our vestibular cochlear nerve. And unfortunately, we've realized that we don't have a tuning fork with us. I'm sorry for our ill preparedness, but it's going to be OK. Um, so imagine that you have a tuning fork here. We can bring this as, your, as our example. And for Weber's, you would hit it. And we like to hit our tuning forks with a um, reflex hammer. Um, that's what Dr. Gugliardo teaches us. So make sure you do it And when you're in clet. So you're going to hit it. And then for Weber's, you're going to have the patient um, ask the patient if they can hear the sound and then if they hear it equally in both ears or if there's one side that um, they hear it more in. And so that is looking for sensory neural versus consolidation um, for sound loss. And then for, the, for Ryan's test, you're going to hit the tuning fork again. You're going to place the tuning fork on the patient's mastoid. You're going to ask them to tell you when the sound stops. When the sound stops, you bring it into the front of the ear, and you ask them to um, tell you when the sound stops. And so that is looking for bone conduction versus air conduction, and air conduction should be twice as long as bone conduction in the length that they hear the sound, as well as our finger rub test, which is when you have the patient close your eyes, please. Can you hear this? Tell me when it stops. And can you hear this? Mm -hmm. Tell me when it stops. No. Okay. So we taught you guys that one, but quick review. So those are just some different ways that you can test the hearing portion of the vestibular cochlear, as well as our um, vestibular test. I'm just going to do a simple VOR test on Rope. Um, if you want more to see all of the tests completely, I think we did a really great job in our vestibular week. So go back and review um, the test there so we don't have to get the table out and stuff. Alrighty. So just look straight ahead at me. 
Let me turn your head. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so his eyes move equally and opposite to his head movement. So, yep. <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> Alrighty, so now we're on the last portion of our brainstem. We're into our medulla. Um, there's a Kanye song with medulla oblongata if you want to help you remember the name of it. I just think of it every time I say it, so thought I would mention it. But um, so the glossopharyngeal is our cranial nerve nine. It has both motor and sensory findings, uh, functions, and it is responsible for our gag reflex. This is as well a, um, a strongly parasympathetic nerve. And so sometimes you might see doctors um, telling patients when they want to stimulate their parasympathetic nervous system to uh, activate their gag reflex when they're brushing their teeth. Um, so that is one thing that you can do with this. Um, it is also responsible for the carotid sinus reflex which is when you press on the carotid um, sinus and you activate those receptors, you're also going to get a, um, a decrease in your heart rate. But um, be careful when you're pressing on the carotids on any patient, don't press them bilaterally um, and just yeah, per proceed with caution. And then the, uh, the sensory portion of this as well is going to be the posterior one third of the tongue, which is responsible for bitter taste. Um, that was a that is a thing that is a very old reflex that we have because bitter tastes are usually poisonous and so it also goes with our gag reflex to save us from poisons um, when we were out in our hunter gatherer stages eating leaves and berries and things um, that we didn't always know what they were. So anyway, um, like our facial nerve was the anterior two thirds of the tongue, this is our posterior two th one third of the tongue. So don't get those confused. The facial is salty, sweet, and sour. Our glossopharyngeal, you want to think bitter. So back, bitter. And then our vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. I feel like if anybody can remember any cranial nerve, this is the first one they think of. It's talked about so much nowadays when we hear about our parasympathetic nervous system and our sympathetics being too high and everyone having too much cortisol. Um, this nerve gets brought up a lot for all of those different reasons. It has both motor and sensory functions. Um, if, if you, the patient, you want to ask them about hoarseness in their voice, um, and as well as you want to look at the elevation of their palate. And so you want to look and see where, um, if their palate will elevate equally and symmetrically on both sides. And the way that you can see that really easily is by looking for uvular deviation. So if one side of the soft palate does not rise when the patient go, um, opens their mouth, you can have the patient go, ah, ah, and when they make that sound, it's going to activate it even further, and you're going to see um, that the uvula will deviate to the normal side. So if you think about holding up puppet strings and you have the puppet in the middle, when you raise one side, it's going to pull the, um, the uvula towards the normal side that, raise, that ri um, raised appropriately. So think of this, the uvula, as being pulled. It can be confusing, um, or I think just a lot of people will get confused between the deviations of the tongue and the uvula, but think of the uvula as being pulled up and so it pulls to the normal side. Um, ablative lesions can be extremely serious with our vagus nerve because of its strong parasympathetic um, activation. And so the, some of the mo more serious things that you can see with it in a patient is um, heart conditions. You can see arrhythmia, bradycardia, um, and laryngeal paralysis. You can also get a lot of um, gastrointestinal or visceral um, symptomatology. So another thing that isn't directly a vagal nerve test but when you, like I said, when we're looking at our cranial nerves, we want to look at all of the information and think about what pieces of the puzzle um, this is telling us in our complete picture of the patient's nervous system. So because we know our vagus nerve has such strong parasympathetic stimulation to all of our visceral organs, when you're doing your bowel sounds and um, different visceral tests, when you're listening to the lungs, or if you put a pulse ox on a patient and you're looking, or even blood pressure and things like that, and you're looking at these different autonomic findings 
that we're going to talk a lot about next week. I want you to think about this cranial nerve exam and that vagus nerve and see if there's any correlation between maybe when you're taking the patient's history, they have a lot of um, they have a lot of um, gastrointestinal issues, or they have just a history of um, arrhythmia or heart problems or low blood pressure, things like that, then you might think you want to look more seriously into this PMRF region and into this vagus nerve to see if that could be contributing to these symptoms that they're having. So lastly, last two, um, we have our spinal accessory nerve, which is our trapezius and SCM activation. And um, we are getting, this is a mainly a motor nerve. So especially as chiropractors, this is going to be extremely important to us when we're assessing this upper neck portion, when we're looking at posture and tone in our patients. When we're going to adjust them for a cervical and you're just, just feeling their neck, think about this SCM activation or these traps, um, their muscle tone, and notice maybe if one side is higher than the other. And then when you're doing this in combination with your cranial nerve and your brainstem evaluation, maybe if there's um, pieces that correlate, they can give you a better insight into a possible reason why their SCM might be chronically tight or their trap might be chronically tight. Um, next, and finally, we have our 12th cranial nerve, which is our hypoglossal nerve. So this is also a motor nerve. Um, it's mainly thought of for our tongue. So you're gonna have the patient stick their tongue just straight out at you. And then you're going to look for any deviations. So if the tongue, this one, like I remember I was saying the uvula is a pull mechanism, so it's going to pull towards the normal side. Think of the tongue as a push mechanism. And so we're pushing the tongue out bilaterally. If there's one side that is, is weak, it's going to be pushed towards the weak side. So the strong normal side is going to push it towards the weak side. So whichever way the tongue deviates is usually towards the side of weakness. Um, you're also going to just be looking for fasciculations and atrophy in the tongue, which can give you um, the idea about the tone of the tongue um, or maybe how long this has been going on if they have an, um, some dysfunction or um, just low activation in this area of their brainstem. And like I said, unilateral paralysis, the tongue will deviate to the abnormal side. And then an easy way to do this, um, to muscle test the tongue, is just have the patient place their tongue into the side of their cheek and press on their, cheek, uh, press on their tongue through their cheek and hold, just like you would do any muscle test, and then compare on both sides to see if there's any differences. Alrighty, so this is our final breakout of the night. Let's go ahead and do the medulla breakout. All right, you guys, so we're back for our medulla breakout. So we're going to start with our glossopharyngeal nerve. So, Rope, have you had any changes in your taste? No. Noticed any? Have you had any, um, have you been able to taste bitter things? All good, yeah. Okay, Nothing abnormal. cool. That's great. Have you had any um, hoarseness in your voice? Nope. Okay, and so we're, we could take his blood pressure, things like that, um, to get an idea of the vagus nerve, looking at more of that parasympathetic function, but we're gonna go a lot more into that testing next week when we do autonomic. So I'm just gonna look into his mouth to see if his palate rises um, evenly on both sides. So just open your mouth and say ah. Uh. And it's beautiful. And if you wanna say ah a few times, but I could see very clearly even before he said ah, it stayed evenly and then with the added vibration, when he said, ah, it did not deviate at all on either side. Um, so now we're going to go into our spinal accessory nerve. So I'm going to go behind him. And can I have you just shrug your shoulders up? And that's the trap test. And then we're going to use our anterior canals to test our SCMs. So push and push. Alrighty, and both of his were strong. So that's his cranial nerve 11. And then hypoglossal. Okay, can I have you stick your tongue out at me? Okay, good. And it deviates maybe a little bit to the right, but his head's also twisted, so you have to kind of observe everything. Um, and then we're going to um, have him put his tongue in the side of his cheek and hold. 
and hold. Good. And that's it. So that is our cranial nerve exam. I hope you guys learned something new, or if not, had a great review. Thanks for joining us again this week, and we'll see you guys next week for autonomics. Be sure to tune in. It's going to be a really important lesson. So see you guys next week.